Please turn with me now in your Bibles to 1 John, 1 John chapter 4, 1 John, the fourth chapter. This morning we're going to be looking at the theme or the title of discerning truth from error discerning truth from error. And as we think about discerning truth from error, we live in a world with so much information, don't we? We live in a world with so much information in our pockets, on our phones, and it's very hard at times, isn't it, to work out what is true and what is false. Uh, I remember the last few years between the start of the pandemic, COVID pandemic, and we're almost overwhelmed with information, so much information coming through. And I remember um, we had, at the time, family in Italy, and these scary pictures start coming in from Italy, and hospitals, and various different things. And we all wonder, will it be as bad as the Spanish flu? And for a while there, in 2020, I actually thought it might be. And the, the, the pictures scared many, but like any new virus in history, we built up an immunity to it and things keep going. It was a nasty experience when I got it back in 2020. I was in bed for five days. It was horrible. And then I was worried about my friend, who I thought would be very immunocompromised, but he got it and it was fine. I was sick as a dog for five days. But I guess what I realized over that time was this, God's in control. God is in control. The world may be panicking around us, but God is in control. And it was not as bad as we first thought. Yes, people suffered, um, but not nearly as much as we thought, because our God is in control. And we wonder, and this, pe- this very, very serious-minded people are saying, hmm, did we get everything right over the last couple of years? And they'll probably say, no, we didn't. So as we come to eternal truth, the most important truth of all, how do we know what is right and what is wrong? It's not easy, is it? None of this is easy. Uh, We're bombarded with information, not just about viruses, but also about the Bible and what different teachings. You can listen to any preacher around the world at the touch of a, a button on your phone. How do you know what is truth And what is error? Not everything you read in the news is going to affect us. Some things have nothing to do with us. But eternal truth, spiritual truth, it affects us all. Every single last one of us. Whether you're a boy or a girl or an older person. It affects every single person. So we all... All of us, as we read this passage, need to think, we all need to discern between truth and error. We all need to think, how can I tell what is true from what is false? What is deceptive? What is falsehood? Because it's very important, not just for us, but also the next generation. The next generation. Truth matters. And it will have an impact not only on our own souls, but on our children's souls and upon our children's children's souls. So as we read this, I want us to think about this. How do we discern between truth and error? So we're going to read the first six verses from 1 John chapter 4. 1 John chapter 4, let us hear God's holy and his infallible word. Beloved. Do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. By this you know the spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that does not confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. And this is the spirit of God of the Antichrist, which you have heard was coming and is now already in the world. You are of God, little children, and have overcome them, 
because he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. They are of the world. Therefore, they speak as of the world, and the world hears them. We are of God. He who knows God hears us. He who is not of God does not hear us. By this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. And may the Lord bless the reading of his holy and his infallible word. When I was young, I used to play with toy money. I don't know if the boys and girls know anything about toy money or play money. Our little girls actually have a cash register. We have this in our house. And we pretend, don't we, to be shopkeepers. And we have this toy money. Now, when I was a boy, long time ago, long, long time ago, I also had play money. But there was something different about the play money when I was growing up. Do you know what was different about it? It doesn't look as good as your play money. Do you know that? When, when I look at the play money today, you kind of go, is this real? Sometimes I look at the corner of my eye, is that a real 20 pound note? And it even says on it, not legal tender, or another way of saying it, not real money in big, thick letters. The play money when I was growing up was very obviously not real money, and I can't remember them putting that on there. So the toy money more and more looks like real money, doesn't it? I know sometimes you think, is it real money? It looks very impressive, very close to the real thing. Now, why did they put that letters on there? It says play money or not legal tender. What would happen if you didn't put that on there? Maybe you might pick up that and by accident buy sweets with it. You think it's real. You think it's actual real money. Some false notes look very impressive. Very impressive. And actually, it's very hard to tell when you look up these false uh, banknotes, whether they're real or whether they're fake. But what about false ideas about God? Can they look real sometimes? Can they look like the real thing sometimes? At a glance, very quickly, they can. Unless we know what to look for in the truth. At times, they can look like the real thing. Sometimes we need teaching, don't we? To tell us what's the difference between the real thing and what is false. Because dear friends, unless we think about money, unless you know what a, what a fake banknote, you know, where they can go wrong, it's very easy to be deceived. And then you receive that money, and what's it worth? Is it worth anything? It's not worth anything. It's worth nothing. This morning, we're going to look at the greatest value, and that is money. Far greater than money. It's eternal truth. Not falsehoods that are worthless, but about God. And may it help us this morning to discern between good and evil, between what is true and what is false. Our first point that we're going to look at here this morning is duty. Duty. Verse number one. Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. And you may ask the question, why should we be discerning? Well, I, I absolutely love this quote from Charles Haddon Spurgeon. And Charles Haddon Spurgeon said this, discernment is not knowing the difference between right and wrong. It is knowing the difference between right and almost right. Do you see what Spurgeon was saying? It's not easy to be discerning. 
it's not easy to distinguish because the counterfeit, the fake, can look very, very close to the real thing. Why do we all need this? I think sometimes we think of discernment or discerning truth from error. Ah, that's just for the minister of the gospel. That's just for the ruling elder. That's just for the deacon. Or that's just for whoever it may be. But we all, every Christian, has a responsibility to be discerning. Everyone. And why do we have this duty? Because there is a real danger. A real danger. Danger. Imagine you have a baby in your house and the baby is crawling along the floor and you know that there's dangerous chemicals along the floor or dangerous things that the baby can pick up and put in his mouth. What should we do? Just say, eh, it's fine, they'll, they'll figure it out. Or do we remove those dangers? Does the danger bring, for those who are older, a responsibility? It does, doesn't it? To, to actually, because a baby doesn't have any discernment. A baby just tastes first and asks questions later. They, put, they can put something dangerous in their mouth. Now, because there's the danger, there's the duty we have. All of us. And what danger do we Christians have? Now, we have physical dangers, but there's even something far more serious than any physical danger we could ever face. Spiritual dangers. I know sometimes when we say spiritual, we think it's not as important. But the spiritual dangers are far more serious. Things that affect the health, not just of our bodies. We're going to have resurrected bodies one day as believers in Christ. But our souls our eternal souls. There's a danger of taking something in it, isn't there? If we've no discernment, we're like that baby, crawling along the floor, grabbing anything that it sees and puts it into his mouth. Some of it might be good, but usually, maybe not. Harming us, and worse than harming us, it's worthless, this, these things. And by putting it into our mouth, I mean believing it. Believing what is false. It says in verse 1 of this chapter, Do not believe every spirit. Now why does John have to say this? Because people do typically believe what they hear. They typically will need to be taught not to be gullible. Easily Deceived, easily cheated. And we can all be gullible, all of us. Now, if we think we can't be, that's, that's dangerous. None of us are too clever. None of us have reached a point in our Christian life where we cannot be deceived by the world, the flesh, and the devil. We never get to the point until we've left this earth and we're in heaven. None of us are. We can all be deceived. And that's why, it's why John writes this. Do not believe every spirit. Because people do often believe every spirit. We all have this danger of believing every spirit. What does that mean? It's not just a voice in your head. I think maybe we think of spirit. It can mean that. It can include a spirit talking and you think you hear audible voices from the other side. It can include that. But not necessarily. Spirit here is believing the prophets, the false prophets spoken about here, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. And these six verses have really have two spirits, if you want to put it like that. Two spirits, a spirit of truth and a spirit of error. It says in verse 6, By this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. By this we know. And to know is to have discernment. Now, there's two sources of information. One of them's right, one of them's wrong. Now, what should we do? Should we be, there's another extreme. Okay, don't believe everything you hear, but should we be skeptical about everything, believing nothing? Well, we shouldn't go there either. We shouldn't go there. Uh, a lot of atheists, I used to think like this until I actually was saved. Oh, I don't believe any of that stuff. 
No, it actually says, test the spirits, prove the spirits. So not to believe nothing, but whatever you do believe, test it. Test it to see if it is true. Because without that testing, what should we do? Do you know what? It's okay sometimes to say, I don't know. It's okay to say that. If you don't know, don't pretend to know. Until we do know. And there's plenty of things I have said to people. They ask me a question. I don't know. Five years later, penny drops. But we need to prove, test what we believe. Now, what do we test it by? What standards? So we have a duty to do this. Number two now, we have a doctrine. Doctrine. So number one is duty. Number two, doctrine. Verses two and three. By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. God And every spirit that does not confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. And this is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard was coming and is now already in the world. So we're saying we must test these things, by, but by what standard? What's the standard by which we test all these things? How do we determine what is right and wrong? Teaching. Or doctrine. Doctrine. By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses. That's a, that's a truth that Jesus, has come, Jesus Christ has come in the flesh. That is a doctrine. And at that time, there was a doctrine or a teaching that was being challenged and being rejected. I remember when I was working in my parents' shop growing up and we would get paper money. We didn't have those fancy machines. You know, you put it underneath the machine and it goes, I think it's blue or a certain color. When it's real and when it's not real, you can tell. We didn't have any of those. So we would check the ridges with our nail and also check the watermark. And those things are very, very hard to fake. Is it real? Is it really worth, if you get a 10 pound note, is that really worth 10 pounds? Or is it in fact worthless? Worthless. Actually, in fact, if you brought it to a shop, it's more dangerous than that. It's actually illegal to use them. Now today, banknotes have changed a lot. And you need to learn about them to work with money. To learn things about what is real money. Notice how I say what is real. We start off with what the real thing is. And what is, what is not real? Everything else. Anything else. Any departure from that standard. Now, for much of the Western church, the evangelical church... The big danger we have fallen into is this, that we think, well, as long as I know the gospel, as long as I have enough that I am saved, I'm going to stop. Don't need to go any further than that. But dear friends, the gospel is the deepest, most glorious, most wonderful truth you will ever look into. And you will never come to the bottom of the glories and the beauties of the glorious gospel. Learning about what Christ endured for us. Learning about how he rose from the dead. Learning about how he died in our place. Learning about how he, was God, how he is God and was God. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. We can never outgrow that. And think, ah, I know the gospel and I am done. Yes, enough for salvation, enough for basic information but even in eternity we will be in awe of him and what he has done the more we know the truth dear friends the more we will be able to distinguish what is false and what is that? everything else 
everything else. A few weeks ago, we looked at a sermon on worship, Leviticus chapter 10. And we were looking at the errors of Nadab and Abihu and the consequences of them offering something that was not commanded by God. Now, unless you start off positively with what real worship is, how will you know what is false? How will you know when you see something that it is not commanded? Well, you start off, what is the commanded? What is not commanded? Everything else. It is the truth we have to learn. The truth, and anything departs from truth, we must not follow. We all have things to grow in. We're all learning in these things. And the more we know and love the truth, the less likely, and I'm not saying we all will get believe some degree of falsehood, all of us, myself included. But the more we love the truth and the more we know the truth and hide it in our hearts with a humble heart, we're less likely to believe falsehood. And I say a humble heart. There's plenty of people who know lots of things and don't have a humble heart. That's dangerous. Now, I want to, want to look at this verse 2 and 3, and I want to point out what it's not saying. It says, By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. Now, the danger, you might read that and think, well, as long as you believe Jesus came in the flesh, you're okay. You're good to go. That's not really what the text is saying. And every spirit that does not confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. John was dealing with a very specific issue of the day. And that, in that day, there was a lot of people who were saying, matter, flesh, that's evil. Spirit, that's good. So Jesus, there's no possibility, they would say, that Jesus came in the flesh. And it was a major, major heresy in the early church. John, at the end of chapter 3, says this, By this we know that he abides in us by the Spirit whom he has given us. So he's talking about the Spirit but he wants to make very, very clear that the spirit, you're not just saying, well, the spirit's good and matter is evil. Because that was a teaching that was very common of the day. But what is he saying? Well, these people, they rejected that Jesus came in the flesh. And if they teach that, that Jesus didn't come in the flesh, they are, without a shadow of a doubt, a false teacher. A false teacher. If they reject this teaching, this very basic teaching that Jesus came in the flesh, which, which is constantly told us throughout the Gospels, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. What does it tell us? It tells us that they don't know God. By this, you know the Spirit of God. How do you know the Spirit of God? Every spirit that confesses. Doctrine For us today, okay, we're not dealing with this specific error um, often, but how do we know the Spirit of God? What we believe. Doctrine. And we may go, to a, we may go on holiday, perhaps you walk into a church, and you find out that church denies the virgin birth of Christ. And you think, how, how would that happen? How could a church deny the virgin birth of Christ? Well, at the beginning, a long time ago, they believed that just feelings mattered. Doctrine doesn't matter at all. What you believe, nah, that doesn't matter. And once you go down that route, dear friends, you're on your road to liberalism. If it's all about feelings and not about what we believe, then it's a very, very dangerous road. We need to know good doctrine. That's why in the evenings we're going through the doctrines found in the Westminster Larger Catechism. So that we can discern truth from error. And we can also discern some doctrines are more important than others, aren't they? Not all doctrine is equally important. 
All of the Bible is important. From Genesis 1 to Revelation 22, every single jot and tittle of the Bible, all of it's important, but not every doctrine is on the same level of, of importance. If somebody gets the gospel wrong and teaches a false gospel, saying that you can save yourself, well, you're on your way to hell. That's very, very serious. But there are other areas, while they're important, they're not as serious, but still important. But, falsehood, no matter what degree of damage it may do to our souls, it does damage. Imagine again, you're, you're like, if you're, you're like a spiritual babe crawling along the floor, picking up any, anything that you find, putting it in your mouth, believing anything. Well, spiritually, you may be at the poison control center very, very quickly. How can we grow in doctrine and teaching? Well, yes, we read our Bibles, but do you come to every service of worship when you're physically able to come? I know there's some people who are sick and can't come, and, and some people come as much as they possibly can. Praise God for that. I don't want to put any extra pressure on people who have health problems. But we should never neglect the service of worship when we're able to come. Most likely you will come then under the spirit of error. Once you neglect the, the means of grace, the devil is pouncing at the door. The world of flesh and the devil is rubbing its hands together. Now I am far from a perfect preacher. Far from that. But dear friends, you must come and grow consistently under the same church. You could visit other churches. I often visit other churches as well. But we must know what we believe. If we drift from church to church, after a while, truth will not matter. Oh yeah, Christians disagree on this and that, but it doesn't matter. Your discernment will weaken. Yes, we can love other Christians. Love them. Fellowship with them. But know the truth. Know the truth. How else can you grow in doctrine? Read books. Of course, the Bible. The Bible is your sustenance. It is your food and drink. If you don't have your breakfast in the morning, you're going to feel pretty weak. But there's good Christian books. There's simple, short books. About 50 pages, 40 pages long. You don't have to be a reader to read these books. Catechisms, they're not just for children. The shorter catechism, that's a wonderful thing for anybody of any age to read. People you're traveling, there's so many things you can get on your phone these days, podcasts and other things. Take every opportunity to grow. That you may have wisdom and discernment so that when you see the falsehood, you're going to go, I can't put my finger on it, but I know it's wrong. Something about it. May the Lord work in your heart. Our final point that we're going to look at here this morning is deliverance. Deliverance. So we've looked at duty. And with the duty, we have a doctrine we must learn. But also deliverance, number three. It's not just about books and learning. I know that. It's not just about books and learning. It's a rescue mission for our souls, really. Rescuing us from error and wandering away from the truth. Verse 4 says this. You are of God. Little children. I love John when he addresses his writers that way. One word in Greek. Little children. It's very tender. He cares so much about them. He's willing to tell them these very, very challenging and searching Truths, but he comforts them here. Verse 4 You are of God. You. Who is that? Me? Yes. You, the believer in Jesus Christ. You are of God. Now, there's sometimes we can't see this in, in our English translations, but there's an emphasis on the you here. 
In Greek, they don't have to say you. But whenever they do, it's emphasizing, you are of God. Or the King James might say, ye are of God. The you plural, believers of God. Here are words of comfort. You know, if you're reading the previous words, you're, you're worried. It's like, have I believed these falsehood? Have I drifted from the, from the truth? And then here John goes and gives more comfort in the midst. For the, re, the true believer, you are of God, little children. It's there for the person struggling with error. No, so I say struggling, not submitting to error. That's completely different. But the one who struggles with it, the one who wrestles with it, the one who's seeking earnestly to go in the right direction, following the Lord with, with what he's been shown, growing in that truth. And by the way, that ye plural, you're not alone. Ye are of God, little children, and have overcome them. Because he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. Because we may read this and get worried. Am I, do I know enough? Um, will I get, what if I don't know this and I'm distracted by this error? And it's a danger. It's a real danger that we can be dominated by fear in our Christian walk. We shouldn't be in a Christian walk walking around like we're walking on eggshells. Fear can dominate. But what have we to fear? You are of God. Of God. And you, plural, have overcome them, the spirit of these false teachers. So you think, have I been deceived? And you're worried about it. No, no, you've already had victory. Your victory is assured in Jesus Christ. John seeks to assure or to reassure the true believer who is struggling here. But I will also say this. John is not wishing to be misunderstood. Verse 5 says this. In verse 5, they are of the world. Therefore, they speak as of the world, and the world hears them. Why does John immediately go there? The world hears them. The world loves false teachers. The world gets an audience. If you look on television, often some of the people who are false teachers will be very popular in culture. They love false teaching. The world loves false gospels. The world loves the spirit of error. They love the counterfeit. The real, if they got the real banknote in front of them, they'd look at it and the watermark, they'd hate it. They don't want the real. They want the counterfeit. This lost and fallen world. Do they hear the truth? Does the world hear the truth? It says, therefore they speak as of the world and the world hears them. John does not want to give false assurance to the person who acts like the world, thinks like the world, loves what the world loves, and thinks like the world. He wants to give comfort and reassurance to the person earnestly struggling with this, fearing that he will disappoint, he or she will disappoint his master in heaven. The world does not have the spirit of truth lying in them. They do not have eyes to see and ears to hear, eyes that they would see the horribleness of their sin and the beauty of Christ, seeking to turn from, from sin to righteousness, but also having ears to hear. Do you see the picture there? It says, they, they are of the world, therefore they speak as of the world, and the world hears them, hears them. They have ears for the world, blind to the reality of sin, deaf to the sound of the voice of the shepherd, but they hear the world. Does the world hear our message? Not until God does a work in their heart. And by the way, that is anyone, doesn't matter what age they are, 
God must do a work in the five-year-old. God must do a work in the 50-year-old. God must do a work in the 35-year-old. Or they do not have a hope. Because they are slaves to sin and unrighteousness. John is here excluding those who think like the world. Who are at home in this world. They do not have what believers have. What you have. In Christ, if you're trusting in Jesus Christ, they do not have that. They do not have this this champion, this greater David who champions over the Goliath of this world. You are of God, little children, and have overcome them because he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. So you have no reason to fear if you're a believer in Jesus Christ. Greater is he who is in you. He wins your victories. He fights your battles. He is your champion. And as we think about the world not understanding, therefore they speak as of the world, the world hears them. Uh, the world does, it says, verse six, we are of God. He who knows God hears us. And he who is not of God does not hear us. And it's kind of like we could think of, maybe we could think of it like this. Uh, you know, there's different forms of slang, isn't there? All over the island of Ireland. And, you know, if you don't understand some of these slang phrases, many of them you probably should never use, but there are some ones that you hear and go, what's he saying? I remember the first time I heard up here, boys a deer, I didn't know what the person was saying. I had to Google it. Um, and apparently it means uh, some, how you respond to bad news. Seriously. I lived in Dundalk for many years. Never heard the phrase once. Um... So I had no idea what it meant. I know more and more what it means now. I even googled uh, cork slang. Because I don't realize I use it. I'm probably, I, I say things that you're probably going, you're probably scratching your heads. And what did he just say there? There's one phrase I didn't realize was actually cork slang. Chalk it down. Have you ever heard me say that? You probably, I've probably lost you whenever I've said that. But my apologies. But do you see how sometimes, whether you go to Mayo... Connacht, whether you go to Leinster or Dublin, whether you go to Munster, there's certain phrases, if you're not from the area, you're going to be like, what are they talking about? The world has a language, doesn't it? The fallen world has a language. That us Christians, because we've been changed, we don't understand it. Christians have words and phrases the world doesn't understand. I remember when I got saved in 2009, I had no idea what a born-again Christian was. I'd heard the phrase. I thought it was a, a group. Where is the local uh, born-again Christians? And then I realized, no, no, it's just anybody who's born of God. It's any Christian church that preaches the true gospel, and it is anyone who has trusted in Jesus Christ. It is a spiritual birth from on high. Not only do we have the same language of Christians, we also have the language of heaven. Look at verse 4 again. We are of God. He who knows God hears us. We share the same language. We share the same understanding. Not perfectly, of course. Not perfectly. But we have that same language. So we hear one another. But not only that, God hears us. God hears you, believer in Jesus Christ. If you come to him through Jesus Christ, he hears you. He hears you. And not just he is aware that you're praying. God is aware of everything. It's a more intimate thing than that. It is God hears and responds to your prayer. Isn't that wonderful? After all these things we've looked at this morning, truth from error, we are of God. Again, there's that emphasis that John gives in the sentence. We are of God. And we have a greater champion than the world's. We ought to pity the world. Pity the world. Because they're blind. Father, forgive them. For they know not what they do. They are blind. Friends, there's a sense of which I ought not to be here. What do I mean by that? But for the grace of God, it'd still be done in cork. But for the grace of God, 
I could well be in hell today. I value and am thankful for every single day I'm alive. And I can't wait for heaven the more and more I go through this wilderness of this world. And I love more and more the sound of the shepherd's voice. We face great challenges. We are of God. He who knows God hears us. He who is not of God does not hear us. We need to hear each other. We need to pray for each other. Because we've been delivered, not as individuals, not as isolated islands. We've been saved as a body. What did Jesus say to his father in John 17? I pray, not for the world, but for those whom thou hast given me. One body. Yes, we need to know the truth, but we have something wonderful. We have the truth, the way, and the life that frees us from hell, frees us from our sin. And the question this morning, do you follow truth? Truth, the spirit of truth. And if that is the case, dear friends, you are of God. But do you wonder? This word here, the spirit of error could also be translated the spirit of roaming. The spirit of wandering. If you wander from the truth, that is a cause for concern. It doesn't mean you're not a Christian. Come to him for assurance. Come to him that he may bring you back onto that narrow road that leadeth unto life. And few there be that find it. Amen. Thank you.